when I was a kid, my dad built me this long wooden table that was in our basement. It was short, so I could kneel at it and I could play with my Western Playmobil set. I'd have the uh, the path over here with the horses pulling the wagon into town because they had just got it loaded up from the, the mine where they were mining for gold and got the Indians over here. And then in the middle, there was a saloon with some cowboys out front ready for a good old Western draw. Now, once I got everything set up just the way I liked it, my mom would come downstairs and she'd play with me for hours. We'd sit there and, and I'd be looking at, at the, the beauty of my creation. And she would grab the horses and she'd try to have them literally bring the gold into town. And as soon as her hand came off the horses, I was quick to put the horse in the wagon right back where it belongs. She, she'd want the Indians to meet the cowboys. And I'd be like, whoa, okay, the, the Indians go here, the cowboys go here. They're friends, but they do not move. I don't know what my mom was trying to do in playing with me, but for me, that meant we should just sit here and admire my handiwork. Friends, I was ridiculous. E even as a kid, I was OCD. So pray for my parents. Even better, pray for my wife, Amanda. Have you ever thought of yourself as a king? Probably not, and yet we all act like we're a king. Of our own little kingdoms, getting things set up just the way we like, uh, taking new territory, making sure we protect what we have. You know, we, we, we want to get engaged and, and get married so we can start building our family and the, the life we want together. You know, all the things. We want to get the bonus at work so we can go on that vacation or finally have enough for the down payment on the house with more land. We want to get the degree so that we are more valuable on the open market. We're always looking for opportunities to expand our own little kingdoms. And with expanding our kingdom comes protecting our kingdom. We got to have the fence up around our yard to keep the critters out. We got to uh, have insurance to protect everything. Homeowners insurance, life insurance, car insurance, motorcycle insurance, phone insurance. And as self-appointed kings of our own little kingdoms, uh, something's always on our mind. Sometimes it's consciously, but oftentimes it's subconsciously. And the question is this, how do I secure my security? Depending on how we approach uh, answering this question, we're either going to find ourselves stressed or successful. How do I secure my security? Well, we all ask this question uh, sometimes more frequently than others. It's not a new question. It's actually part of the human condition, and Jesus knew that about us, which is why he addressed it head on. And what he said next in the Sermon on the Mount. If you got a Bible, I invite you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 34, where we're going to see Jesus address our need for security. If you need a Bible, you can, of course, follow along in our free church app, where there's also a place you can jot down some notes. As we've seen in this U-turn series thus far, the way that Jesus is calling us to live is a, a U-turn. It's a change of direction from the way of the world, the way many of us have been living. But when we follow Jesus, we find life. And the same is true in, it, in our pursuit, our search for security. So as we dive into the Sermon on the Mount, yet again, would you bow your heads? Let's pray together and ask that God would speak to us. Lord, please, please speak now. Thank you for speaking as you have been speaking throughout this series. We ask that right now you would reveal your will and your way for our security and how you would relate, have us relate with you. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. All right, let's pick up Jesus' teaching now in Matthew 6, verses 19 through 21. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Right out of the gate, Jesus just blew up the paradigm that storing now equals more later. Storing now doesn't equal more later and 
We all know that's true. I mean, have you ever seen a hearse pulling a U-Haul? Neither have I. And yet we live that, like, that when we bank our, our future security on our savings now. As kings of our own little kingdoms, we will uh, try to ensure a brighter future for ourselves. And we often use money to that end. And it kind of makes sense. Money gives us this feeling of godlike power. With money comes power, prestige, pleasure, even a sense of security. And since money gives us this feeling of godlike power, we are tempted to remove God from the throne of our lives and sit on the throne ourselves, waving money as our scepter. But when we do this, when we play God, in the end, we don't win, we lose. In verse 21, Jesus just cuts right to the heart of the matter. He says it this way, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Our treasure and our heart are intimately and inseparably linked. So where our treasure, so there our heart. Now, don't miss this. Here's what Jesus is getting at. What we treasure reveals what we trust. What we treasure reveals what we trust. So what are you trusting in? Are you trusting in your ability or God's ability for your future security? Are your savings today your only hope for tomorrow? Or are you trusting God today with your tomorrow? <clears throat> Here's the deal. Money, saving, they aren't the issue. They're symptoms of the issue. Money, it's morally neutral. Scripture actually teaches us that we should save for the future. That's a wise way to steward the money we have. But the heart in it is what really matters most. And that's what Jesus is addressing here. Because as we've seen, for Jesus, the heart is the heart of the matter. And our trust is revealed in what we treasure. Now, if you're wondering, okay, what am I trusting in? One way to, to understand or, or come to realize what that is, is just to reflect on what are my eyes set on? Because that's where Jesus goes next. He says, the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Here, Jesus used light and darkness to uh, illustrate our spiritual condition. You see, while we're all on a spiritual journey, some exploring faith, others have been following Jesus for years, we're all on this spiritual journey. But only some of us are walking with our eyes open. Others of us are walking through life with our eyes closed spiritually. You see, unless our eyes take in the light, the light will not enter in and we will not be able to see what's ahead of us. You see, just like light is, is a necessity for our, our physical eyes to function, we need the, the light, the true light, to open our eyes spiritually. Jesus said it this way in John 8. He said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Jesus is the light, and when we fix our eyes on him, he brings everything else into focus and we can follow his lead. The uncertainty of life, the uncertainty of the future slips away because Jesus illuminates his way. <clears throat> and if you find yourself uh, grasping to what's now, holding tightly to what's now, Jesus invites us to, to open our eyes to him and to open our hands to him as well. You see, security tomorrow actually starts with Jesus today. And our eyes open to Jesus for the first time when we choose to receive his forgiveness for our sins. And our eyes open wider to Jesus when we realize more and more of who he is and who he's calling us to be. And the trust he's calling us to place in him, in his Father. Jesus continued, and with our, with our eyes fixed on him, he says, this in verse 24, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Whether we like it or not, as humans, we have the capacity to be devoted in, in, only, to, 
we had the capacity to be devoted and devoted to only one. You see, let me illustrate it this way. Uh, who, who here would like to have two spouses? Uh, gals, can you imagine being married to two husbands? Like that's a lot of cleaning up to do. Or, or guys, imagine having two wives. That, that's a lot of listening. We can't be devoted to more than one because a devoted heart is to one in one alone. You see, a heart becomes divided as soon as one becomes two. A divided heart can't be a devoted heart. We have the capacity to be devoted to one and only one. So whether that's one spouse uh, or whether it's, it's God or it's money, we have the capacity to be devoted to one and only one. You can't serve both God in money because our heart is going to gravitate towards one or the other. Now, while this is like kind of subjective in nature, there's actually a very objective thing that we could do. If you paused or if you just looked back at your last month in your calendar or your last month's bank statement, it would become very clear where your devotion is. So was it to God or was it to money? Whose kingdom were you seeking? Were you seeking to build God's kingdom or your kingdom last month? Those are kind of convicting questions. But I have another I have another question for you. Let me ask you this. Did you feel stressed last month? I, I know I did. And it kind of makes sense. I Gallup is a research group and they do all kinds of research studies. And in their, their study last year, of 2020, they realized that that after a decade of a steady climb, Americans felt the most stress that they've ever felt before. And and it makes sense. Uh, We had crises stacked upon crises, and of course we felt stressed. And the good news is that we, we made it through 2020. It's no longer 2020. But the acute pain that we felt in 2020 has become chronic pain since. And many of us are still oh too well acquainted with stress. More than ever, we're seeking security. The only problem is when we seek security, we get worry. Jesus put it this way, the beginning of verse 25, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life. Therefore, in light of everything I just said, this is what he's like, in light of all of it, don't worry. Just stop it. If only it was that easy, right? But what happens is, is uh, when we function as the king in our lives and we're trying to protect our, our little kingdoms, the net result is worry every time. Whether we're seeking our security today or we're seeking our security tomorrow, when we play God, we lose. The, the stress is the land that we live in. That's why Jesus continued, you know, and he says, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, uh, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you, that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? First the birds, then the flowers. Jesus illustrated that God's got our needs covered. So so worrying is pointless. Like, we don't have to worry. And then he tacks on this little phrase that packs a big punch. You of little faith. The the root of worry is unbelief. Back in college, I was going through a particular stressful season, and it was in that season that the Holy Spirit convicted me that when I'm worrying, when I'm stressed, it's as if I'm saying, God, I don't think you have this one. Because the root of worry is unbelief. And we don't think God can handle it. So what we do is we jump in, we take the reins, we seize control, 
And what ends up happening is we take on a burden that we were just never intended to bear. So we feel the weight of it. We feel the stress, the strain. It doesn't end in our success. It ends in our stress. But in fairness to us, isn't it hard to like trust God with the future? I mean, we haven't seen him move in the future yet. That's why we have to look back at his past faithfulness to give us confidence in the present that he's going to be faithful in the future. You see, neuroscientist Kurt Thompson put it this way. He says, your memory creates your future. That's because you imagine the the future through the, the neural networks created by your past. The experiences that will drive your responses in the future are embedded within your memory. Science is now discovering the way God designed it all along. And we have to look no further than the story of God's people in the Old Testament, the Israelites, to know this is true. They had a a key moment in their story as a people. God freed them from slavery in Egypt, and he instituted the Passover feast festival as as an opportunity for his people, the Israelites, to remember his past faithfulness every single year for every year that followed. And Passover was just one of the many feasts and festivals that God had his people celebrate on an annual basis to be reminded of his past faithfulness. I've experienced this personally. I've shared before in other messages that planting a church in a pandemic has been challenging. It's been so challenging. There's no playbook for this. And there have been days where I've questioned what we're doing. There's been days where I've questioned my calling. There have been days I've even wanted to quit because it's just hard. It is just downright hard. But it's on those days that I I open up a note on my phone because on that note, I've documented all the different points along the way of this church planting journey. And it, it dates all the way back to to early high school when I was at a youth conference and God called me to pastoral ministry. It it has other events like when I was sitting by Nixon's coffee house on the South Platte Trail and God called me to multiply disciples, leaders, and churches. It also includes the account when East Point, our sending church, committed to give us uh, more money financially than they'd ever given to a church plant before because they believed in God's mission coming about through us, through Connect Church. It also includes quotes from people I've heard along the way, like this one from a facilitator of my church planning residency. Sean said this, he said, never doubt in the dark what you've seen in the light. Never doubt in the dark what you've seen in the light. And every time I look back on God's past faithfulness, I'm reminded that he's faithful and it gives me confidence today that he's going to be faithful tomorrow. That's my story and I'm sticking to it. What's your story? Like, how have you seen God be faithful in your past? Where has he shown up in your life? Look at God's past faithfulness and let it replace your worry with trust in him today because our God is ever faithful. This is why Jesus taught the following. He said in verse 31, So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows you need them. Don't worry about your security because God knows that you need these things. The the pagans, they don't don't know God. They don't know God like you do. So they they chase after all these things, food and pleasure and, and the whole deal. But you, you know God. Jesus, he opened your eyes to who he is. You're walking in the light. So you don't have to to chase what everyone else is chasing. We get to to walk and step with Jesus each and every day. So what does this look like? Because, you know, for for many of us, we're pretty accustomed to seeking security. We're well acquainted with worry. What would it look like to, to trust God today with tomorrow? How can we be about what he's about? Well, what Jesus is calling us to. What is Jesus' way? Well, verse 33, Jesus just kind of lays it on the table. He says, But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, for all these things will be given to you as well. What does a life of trust over worry look like? Seek first God's righteousness and God's kingdom, his character, his mission. And it's not that God doesn't want us to be secure. He's, He's all about it. He just wants us to be all about him. 
The bottom line for Jesus in this section of the Sermon on the Mount is this. Seek security and get worry. Seek God and get security. How can we make seeking God's character in his mission a keystone habit in our life? You're probably familiar with habits. Uh, you, you plug your phone in at night, you brush your teeth, you wear deodorant. If you don't, please start. Uh, but what's a keystone habit? Well, Charles Duhigg writes this in the, the Power of Habit. He says, a keystone habit is small changes or habits that introduce people, that people introduce into their routines that unintentionally carry over into other aspects of their lives. So a keystone habit is, is a small thing that we instill in our life that has a big compounding impact. Okay? Now, how can we make seeking God's character in his mission a keystone habit for us? Well, here are four habits, very simple habits that we could instill in our lives to help us seek first God's character in his mission. All right. We got two to seek his character and then two to seek his mission. Here's the first. Schedule a standing appointment with God and keep it. Everyone and everything is competing for time on our schedule, right? There's so much opportunity ahead of us, and yet we all have the same 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. And, and when we think about living our lives, the a strategic thing for us to do would be to, to schedule the most important appointment first. Time with God, time in His presence, where we get to read Scripture, we get to talk with Him in prayer. So, so schedule time with God, and then do your best to keep it. Because here's the deal. Life happens, right? Like, we go on vacation, and the kids are climbing all over us. We, we, we had a long day. We're just exhausted, and we just want to go to bed. Or, or we're sleeping, and we just want to hit the snooze button one more time. Like, keeping the appointment with God can be hard. So when you, when you don't keep it, don't beat yourself up about it. Just try again tomorrow. Because when this starts to become a keystone habit in our life, it starts to, to change us because as we get to know God's character, He changes our character. And He makes us a better friend, a better spouse, a better parent, a better student, a better coworker. So schedule time with God and keep it. And the second is this, schedule time with God's people and show up. Uh, you, you'll find a workaholic at the office, an alcoholic at the bar, a shopaholic at the mall, but where do you find Christians? Church. But you know what? Church isn't a place. Church is a community. Church is the people of God. People who have a relationship with God, relationship with one another, and they're living on mission with God. Be the church. Uh, it, you become who you surround yourself with. We all know it's true. We, we've seen it in the, in the lives of our friends. We've seen it even in our own lives. So if you want to become like a Jesus follower, spend your time with Jesus followers. And, and for us parents, if you want your kids to, to value God, value time with His church, if you want your kids to approach God like he's an option, just approach church like it's an option when you consider your weekend. Because what we prioritize reveals what's a priority. I know that's not very profound, but it is true, and it can be kind of convicting. So even when you don't feel like it, I want to challenge you, show up. Show up to group. Coming to a service is good. You know, we love to gather. We love to worship together. We love to be together. And we love to talk about our faith together. So go to group two. And you do it when you, even when you don't feel like it. There have been so many times where I get home from work and Amanda and I look at each other and we're like, oh, we just don't want to do group tonight. And I got to tell you, after we gather with others who are seeking to follow Jesus too, there has not been a time where we have looked at each other after a group and said, Ugh, that was a waste of our time. Even the days that we are exhausted, we are just wrung out, and we show up to group, and then the, the group, our group members, our friends, get to be the church to us, lifting us up, encouraging us. It is so worth it. So show up. Don't just sign up. Now, 
To seek God's mission, here are a couple ways we can do that. Three, set aside a percentage of our income and give it to God. Just give it. What we do with our treasure reveals what we trust. So if you trust God, put your money where your mouth is. Demonstrate your dependence upon Him with the way you're generous with what He gives you. And if, if we're parents, again, here's a little word for you. Don't just model this for your kids. Coach them in it. Like when they get an allowance for the first time, if you do that, or they receive their first paycheck, from that, that first moment, that first interaction with money, teach them that, that, God, that money is ultimately God's and he gives it to us to, to steward, to manage on his behalf. And we demonstrate our trust in him when we give it back to him. If your giving has grown comfortable or when my giving grows comfortable, the, the challenge for us is that we go before God again and say, hey God, What would it look like for me to give in a way that I have to trust you more? Because when we trust him more, we grow in our faith. We grow in our relationship with him. The fourth way that we, the fourth habit we can instill is this. Set aside time in our week to serve with God's people and do it. Jesus never said, attend me. He said, follow me. Jesus didn't call us to consume. He called us to contribute. We don't go to church. We are the church. So when you use your gift and I use my gift, together we get to join God in what he is doing in our region. And it is a blast. We get to see lives changed. We get to see people who were disconnected from God, disconnected from community. We get to see them connect with him. What a privilege. Time with God, time with community, giving a percentage of our income, serving the church. These are just four keystone habits that we could instill in our life to be a people who seek first God's character and God's mission. Now, if you're looking at all four of them and none of those are part of your life right now, it could be rather paralyzing if you try to do all of them at once. So what I would encourage you to do is just pick one. Maybe it's time with God, reading the Bible, praying, or time with his people. Pick one and and Make that part of your regular rhythm of life. For many of us, uh, a couple of these habits are habits in our own lives, and uh, some are more consistent than others, and that's okay, right? We're all human. We're all on this journey. My challenge for you would be, don't don't be content or complacent with where you're at. Like, let's get to know God more. Let's seek Him more. Let's seek what He's about more. So so pick one that you're not strong in, and, and why don't you start doing that? And for some of us, maybe you've been following Jesus for some time. And and actually all four of these, they're keystone habits in your life. I just want to say, that's awesome. I would love to hear your story. I'd love to hear the impact that's making in your life. And, And I would love to even talk about what else does Jesus have for you? Because Jesus has so much more for us. But I believe, I believe that if we can instill these four keystone habits from my time in scripture, from my own personal experience, these won't just have an impact in our lives. They actually have a ripple effect in the lives of those around us. That's what makes them keystone habits. We've sought security for ourselves. We're familiar with worry, but we don't want to live that way anymore. We want to follow Jesus in his way. And what we've learned is that if we seek security, we're going to get worry. But if we seek God, we'll get security. That's why Jesus concluded with this. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Don't worry about the future. Trust God today with tomorrow. And when we step off the throne and we let God be king... We win with him in the end. Let me pray for us. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for speaking to what goes on in our hearts and minds. Would you help us to trust you today? And then would you help us trust you tomorrow? Uh, We want to live each and every moment fully surrendered to you. So would you free us from the worry that, that we all feel? Would you help us to trust you? Would you help us to see your past faithfulness and rely on that to give us the confidence that you're going to be faithful in the future? We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. 
Thanks for watching. We hope that the message encouraged your faith. If it did, be sure to subscribe and share it with a friend to encourage them too. My name's Chris. I have the privilege of serving as the lead pastor here at Connect Church, where we believe that life with Jesus and life with others is best. That's why we exist as a church to connect the disconnected to a growing relationship with God. And we do that in a couple of ways. First is help you connect with Jesus through our weekly services. Second, connect with people through joining a community group where you can make some friends and grow in your faith. And third, connect people with Jesus by serving and sharing your story with others. I hope to see you at a worship service soon. And in the meantime, be sure to download our free church app by searching Connect Church Community in your phone's app store. The app is the best way to stay up on everything that's going on around Connect. Let us know how we can help you get connected by filling out a Connect card, find a group, and even give to help see this mission and ministry advance so that more lives can be touched with the good news of Jesus. You can connect with God, community, and your purpose, and we're here to help. See you soon.